Hey, Ross Street Roasting fans, this is Roaster Brian Gum with Ross Street Roasting. Um, and I am having a nice little informal chat with our uh, Nicaraguan coffee trade partner of uh, five years now, Ben Weiner of Gold Mountain Coffee Growers. We have been purchasing coffee from uh, Ben and all the uh, staff and partner farmers and families and communities with Gold Mountain for uh, all five years of our business since 2015. We've been down to visit um, twice and it's been a year and a half since our last trip to Nicaragua and we have a lot of new customers since then so there may be a good number of people who've not heard us uh, talk about or seen our uh, trip video from our last time when we went down with Farmer Derek. Um, so I wanted to just kind of reintroduce Gold Mountain and have a conversation with Ben and also uh, just kind of get an update on how things are going for uh, coffee producers in that area, given what's happening with uh, the coronavirus. So welcome Ben and to all of you, now I'm going to kind of ignore the audience, so to speak, and, and Ben and I are just going to have a, a kind of a, a short, free-flowing conversation. So, Ben, great to see you again. Same. Thanks, Brian. So, if you want, I can give a little intro to Gold Mountain and show people the work that we do. Yeah, let's do that. Take people on a little mini origin trip. So, this is the view from our farm, Finca Idealista, which Ross Street has now visited. And even brought down people from your community, which is so cool. So people have won a whole bunch of medals using coffee from Gold Mountain Coffee Growers. We're a specialty coffee farming group in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. And so to show you guys what it takes for roasters, including Ross Street, to win so many medals with our coffee in just 2019 alone. Right. Oh, look, there you go. That's awesome, Brian. Three of ours. Awesome. And so the first step is planting. So we plant coffee from seed. This is a long process. Farmers in our group who are of very short economic means start with a seed and have no income for almost five years because it takes that long for coffee to be producing strongly. And it starts out in this stage, which is called the matchstick phase. And the coffee grows up bit by bit, little by little. It gets bigger, we transplant it, and we don't use herbicides on our farm, and we encourage the same practices in our farming group with all farmers. And so this is a machete that we're using to weed instead of herbicides. It's quite the long process. It takes an awful lot of work to be chopping weeds this much and doing everything very manually in Nicaragua. And then eventually the coffee is bigger like this. So this is coffee that Ross Street came and saw after about five years of growing. And in the background there is a rainforest that we bought just to protect it. And so then picking. We pick at the peak of ripeness. This also takes a lot of work with picking efforts. We don't just strip pick, which is if you were just to go and take that whole entire strip of coffee and take all of it. Rather, we go through bit by bit and make sure that we're only getting the ripest cherries. We use refractometers to measure the sugar content of cherries. We're treating coffee farming like grape growing for fine wine using some of the same tools actually. That's a Brix refractometer to measure the sugar content of cherries because coffee tastes better when it's picked ripe, just like many fruits out there. We separate coffee by variety, and we separate coffee cherries by ripeness. Even after picking, we go through another time and make sure that it's as perfect as possible. So this is a lot of work by our staff. Ross Street has seen this firsthand, and you guys actually came and did some picking yourselves. So here's the coffee when it gets depulped. So we take it out of the cherry. So it's more like the coffee that people know and love before it's roasted. But before that, before it can be roasted, we have to, if it's honey process, dry it in the sun. And if it's washed process, we have to ferment it and then wash it so that the mucilage, this sticky stuff that's around each bean, can come off in water. It'll only come off if you ferment it. 
That's why coffee is fermented in many cases. And then after the washing, we dry on raised beds. We've built over a thousand raised beds. So you guys were lucky enough to come and see all the results of that hard work, which mm -hmm. then involves more work of drying evenly on the raised beds. So as you guys saw and participated in, we all day long are moving the coffee around as it dries in the sun to make mm -hmm. sure that it dries evenly. Quite a lot of work. And that's in contrast to drying on, uh, on the ground on patios, correct? Right, which is not as good because then you're shocking it with too much heat. You get uneven drying underneath on the patio. Mm -hmm. The rain can wet it again, even if you cover it on the patio, it can right. slip in from underneath. We take it off at the perfect moisture level. And then we have the beans be in sacks for about two months so that the humidity level can equalize between beans as it's there in the sacks after it's been dried. We cup every coffee. So we, I'm a Q grader. I cup everything and we have more staff also cup and we make sure that everything's come out perfect. If it's not, we put it in a separate product or sell it locally. And then more and more cup, cupping work. And then we hull it. So we take off the outer layer in the dry processing and we pass it through density sorters. So here there's wind bl air blowing the coffee to the right and the lighter beans get blown over the top by the air. And then the shaking moves the heavier beans to the left. So you see lower quality coffee in my hand right there that came from the right side. And then the shaking of this machine, the vibrating, brings the heavier beans over to the left and you're gonna see a much cleaner result over here in my hand. And then after that, that's still not enough. So we use light sorters to sort through and take out more defects. And then we also go through by hand and make sure that the coffee is perfect. This year we did some of this work at tables, we had masks made for everyone. And then we even do UV sorting. So we sort through here with a special light. And if a bean shines very brightly here, we know that it has either the wrong humidity level or insect damage or maybe some mucilage still on it. So we pull it out so that any roast will be very even. And then we even hand paint bags. So here, local artists in Nicaragua are hand painting every single bag. So the coffee you guys are gonna get very soon is gonna be hand painted, come in hand painted works of art, all of it. And then we ship it in special packaging to keep it fresh and pack it up in shipping containers. And then people can follow the journey on social media. So if anyone goes to at gold MTN coffee, you can see us on Instagram, on Facebook, and Twitter. Yeah. Follow this journey. And Ben, and how many bags does each shipping container hold? 280 or so, sometimes 285. 280 bags that are each 152 pounds each. Yes. Yeah. So all of these are manually moved, mm -hmm. at least to start. We go on forklifts later on. And I just wanted to mention sustainability. So you guys saw, I mean, your, your logo is a frog from our farm actually, which is so yeah. cool. <laughs> yep. and, and so if you'll notice there's a rainforest to the left there that we protect and then our farm right there, we bought that rainforest just to protect it. And we use as few chemicals or harsh environmental practice, you know, harsh agricultural practices as possible and try to be as friendly as we can with the environment. And the result is there are all these tree frogs, there are three-toed sloths running around, and that's some of the results of that work. So that's our farm, Finca Idealista. Here's a three-toed endangered sloth that was very happily walking around <laughs> the farm. We have some in the rainforest that we protect where we don't grow coffee, it's just for protecting the environment. Yeah. And there you go. Do you name him? Do you call him Ross? Yeah. <laughs> so there's Ross. So we have these really cute tree frogs jumping yeah. around. 
If anyone's curious about certifications, we don't pay for certifications actually because we believe in going farther than what certifications require and in showing real results. So for example, instead of buying some kind of environmental certification, we bought a rainforest just to protect it. And we have a huge industrial composting area for coffee cherries and a chicken house above it and the chicken droppings mixed with the the composting cherries makes this beautiful fertilizer. We do all kinds of practices like that. We do free computing classes for girls from coffee communities. And roasters win medals, which I think is better than most certifications out there. They win medals for the quality of the coffee and roasters like you guys can and have come down to visit us and see and verify that everything that we're saying here is actually real. And then the next steps in making this awesome coffee is roasters and consumers. So the coffee gets to places like Ross Street, Ross Street Roasting right here. Yep. And all of the point of this, there, this is actually from when you guys came and visit. Yeah. The, the point of fighting poverty through coffee quality and why we do all of this work is so that when someone drinks a cup of coffee, when they make a pour over, like we're making right there at the top of Finca Idealista, mm -hmm. there is meaning behind that cup. And it's not just some generic cup of coffee, but rather this is a cup of coffee that's having a positive environmental, a positive social impact that is going to really let customers know that by purchasing that coffee, they're making a positive impact in the world and can feel good about what they're drinking. It's award-winning coffee and there's a lot of meaning behind it. Yeah. And that's the view from Finca Idealista, our I flagship think, farm in Nicaragua. That's one of the most beautiful spots I've ever been in, period. And I've I've been around the world, well not all the way around the world, but I've been I've traveled internationally a handful of times and that that place right there is just unreal. I love it there. Awesome. So yeah, that's the idea of what we do. And that's where we are up in the mountains in Nicaragua. Yeah. You guys, an that's idea. Awesome. And Ben, just real quick, give us a really short history of Gold Mountain coffee growers. Yeah. So Gold Mountain, we started out as our farm and then we joined what we were told it was a fair trade co-op and they were a certified one. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, farmers came to us and said, this is not working and fair trade isn't letting us feed our families and we need to do more. We need to be better. And so what we did was we created our specialty coffee farming group based on quality mm -hmm. in order to achieve positive impacts and to fight poverty through coffee quality, mm -hmm. we took a gamble and we said, okay, we're not going to be a charity model. Rather, we're going to try to be an economically and environmentally sustainable farming group. Mm -hmm. And we're going to focus on quality, make this coffee award-winning, the best it can possibly be. We're going to work with farmers at high altitudes, mm -hmm. which means we can't just work with everybody, although we'd love to but we're gonna work with farmers who have the potential to really pull themselves out of poverty because they already have the right conditions. And through a little bit of guidance, we can help make sure that that coffee is super high cupping and something that roasters are gonna be able to get more value out of. And then also have farmers be getting more value out of it yeah. so that they can pull themselves out of poverty. Right, yep. And what year about did you start that was, so 2007 was when mm -hmm. we first got our farm. I first started going to Nicaragua in 2002 to do my thesis research and did an awful lot of research understanding the coffee economy and mm -hmm. saw all of these bottlenecks and how it could be improved in order to benefit not just farmers, but whole communities. And then we took the plunge and got our own farm, which then became our flagship farm. It's actually a very small part of what our farming group does now. Mm -hmm. It's a great example, and you guys have seen it, yeah. and it has our coffee variety museum, and it does have its own significant production, but now a much bigger part 
of what our farming group does is the coffee from everybody. Yeah. Which makes up most of the coffee. Yep. Um, yeah, that was the first time we came down. I think we only stayed on that mountainside where the farm and the wet mill is. Um, but last time we came, uh, Derek and I jumped in the trucks with uh, a couple of your, of your staff guys and we went over the mountain yep. into the department just north of Matagalpa into Hinotega where it's like even, it's like another thousand feet higher up. Um, yeah. Very steep roads. Um, yeah, that's, yep. it's, it's amazing to see the, the, ter the geographic territory that your partner farmer network covers. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of area um, where, I mean, Nicaragua, has challenging roads in the campo in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Roads have actually gotten a lot better, but there are still some where, you know, there are farmers where, you know, this year I would be spending time on a farm and it would be a donkey or a horse ride or hiking mm -hmm. at least a half day just to get there. And then for us to get this coffee to the dry mill would mean the coffee going on the back of a horse or donkey and us mm -hmm. walking with the horses right. uh, up to the main road. And then you saw the trucks that we now have to have to be able to transport coffee from so far off. Yep. They're all four wheel drive. Yep. I mean, if anyone out there likes off roading and I know you're in a farming community that appreciates, yep. you know, some of the challenges of challenging roads, these are all, very strong vehicles then they still sometimes have a you know can't even go to where some of this coffee is yeah no the i got used to driving up uh to the wet mill and finca idealista but a few of the yeah. roads up in hinotega i'm glad i didn't have to drive on those roads because that was uh i like challenging uh driving conditions but that was <laughs> that was a little treacherous yeah yeah definitely well very I mean, cool um yeah. And how, how was the harvest, I mean, even not considering the coronavirus, and actually, I mm -hmm. mean, harvest season probably ended before all of the pandemic stuff started. Is that correct? It, so the harvest was ending right as the pandemic, probably it started, but we didn't quite know it yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we were very lucky. I had just cupped between 1,500 and 200, and, and, 2000 cups of coffee yeah. working, you know, very hard with our team on the quality control. And so luckily I was traveling. We, we decided to throw hundreds of pounds of samples in my suitcases and not expect the mail to be working. And then there were disruptions in the mail. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really good gamble that we, that we took. Um, and, and I was able to bring the samples back, thank goodness. Yeah. So, yeah, so we were able to, to do okay. Yeah. Recognize that guy. Yeah, is that, remember <laughs> him? So, yeah, this is some of the, we can keep talking and keep asking questions. Yeah. These are just some of the scenes from when you were visiting. Yeah, and so overall quality and yield wise, was it a good harvest year? Yeah, it was a, it was a good harvest. Um, there was, ironically, it was a good thing there's, that there was a little bit, oh, good and bad, uh, but there was a little bit less heart coffee than the year before that, mm -hmm. but the quality has been awesome. And this year with all the challenges going on, mm -hmm. it's okay to have a little bit less coffee. We've actually still seen a lot of demand from roasters. People are brewing a lot at home. Yeah. There's Farmer Derek up there yeah. on the Kadialista. And so, yeah, we're actually going through coffee pretty quick, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, there are certain challenges. We, we can't just stop farming. Yeah. So we had to get everybody masks and mm -hmm. keep working, but in a safe way as possible, as much obviously distancing wherever it's possible. Yeah. Um, on the farm, that's not that hard in the sorting. Yeah. We had to get a whole bunch of tables and spread people out compared to the usual way we would do sorting. Yeah. Good. And your offices are in the city of Matagalpa. Has, has, have things in the city in Matagalpa been a little bit more 
nerve wracking or unsafe or have to take a few extra precautions there versus in the countryside? Yeah, we're driving our staff around in our vehicles instead of having them take public transportation. Mm-hmm. When, when we're working at the dry mill, for example. Yeah. We meet with farmers on the porch outside <laughs> instead of inside. Yeah. Some simple things like that. Good. Lots of hand sanitizer. Yeah. Just saw uh, my favorite farmer, <laughs> Ronald. <laughs> Yeah, Ronald and Noelia. Yeah. Oh, look, there's your divine inspiration. Yep. Coffee. That's great. Now, Ronald and Noelia's family uh, is one that is up the hill from the wet mill is Finca Idealista, and then further up the mountain is, uh, and they're in Las Nubes? Yes. Yeah, in and around Las Nubes. Um, so we have visited that family twice. Yep. Yeah, they're wonderful. Yeah, great, great people. Um, well, that's good. I, I'm really excited. We, um, last year, we sold out of our Divine Inspiration coffee way sooner than I anticipated, uh, which was good. I mean, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, so it's, and I have, you know, there's a handful there's some online customers who really love it. Um, and so they're really excited to get, get it back. We have a food co-op that is uh, located here in, in the state of Iowa in Cedar Rapids to the east of us an hour. Um, they have three local uh, grocery stores. They're big fans of Divine Inspiration and they've, they've seen our video and shared it on their own social media. So there's, uh, there's some uh, fans of Gold Mountain Coffee's uh, that are roasted by Ross Street Roasting who are eagerly awaiting this year's harvest. So we can't, awesome. wait, can't wait to get them in. And they're on a ship somewhere in the Caribbean right now? Yeah, so the coffee is just arriving in New York. Oh, okay. Well, it depends which coffee. So okay. there are some coffees that are just about to go yeah. on the ocean, but uh, there are also a lot of coffees that are just arriving in New York okay. right now. So you ship so, multiple containers on different ships? Yeah, we okay. have two containers arriving mm-hmm. imminently. Yeah. And depending on, I have to go look at which coffees you guys ordered, but mm-hmm. um, probably some of them are arriving right now and then some later on. Yeah, good. Well, we're super excited. Um, well, I think that's, that's all I had. I just wanted to mm-hmm. have a quick... Uh, update chat and and something to record and share with Ross Street Roasting folks because it has been a while since we've done some kind of like you know spotlight on on Gold Mountain so since the coffees are going to be here shortly and you know this has been a crazy year for everybody around the world um, Mm -hmm. it's just good to connect with you and and share about our relationship over the past five years and and give people kind of bigger context for it too because it's always a I mean when when fans of ours connect with our, our, the story of um, Ross Street Roasting is very closely tied to Gold Mountain Coffee Growers because you were our first supply relationship. Our logo on our bags was like, you know, uh, is connected to the tree frog. There's yeah. so many, there's so many ways that we've, we've kind of developed a really cool um, working relationship. Uh, so yeah, I always love to, to kind of share that and and put different pieces of context with it. Uh, yeah, I so. I absolutely love those tree frogs. They're just <laughs> yeah, they're just so amazing. Cool. Well, um, I'll we'll sign off on this recording video and uh, I'll get it shared with everybody here in the next day or so. But thanks thanks a lot, Ben. Um, glad that you're healthy uh, and safe and and. Everybody's kind of working hard uh, down in Nicaragua to, to stay the same. Uh, and we'll be enjoying the fruits of all your labor uh, very soon. Very excited about it. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, a lot of work by a lot of people. On yeah. It's not just farmers, but it's also all of our quality control staff. It's all of the pickers of the farmers, their families, people that work up and wake up at three in the morning or even earlier to start their days. As yeah. you saw, you guys went out and 
started driving around at four in the morning with us yeah. to start the day during the harvest and see how that goes. And yeah. so, so much work by so many people and whole communities that's about to arrive in your roastery. So it's an exciting time and it's awesome connecting with you guys. So thanks yeah. so much. Awesome. Thanks again, Ben. Uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Bye.